okay and so we should be rolling now and I want to go ahead and uh, review some of the things that we were talking about uh, towards the end of last class and remember we had spent some time um, looking at Apple's financial reports, understanding that they had an income statement, a balance sheet. We sort of scrolled through those a little bit. And then uh, we started looking at the example financial reports, uh, much less sophisticated, obviously, than what you might see in Apple's reports. Oh, before I get into that, I guess Elon Musk is having to resign from his own company now because of comments he made about having the ability to take his company private and having the funding to do it. And so some people traded on that and they were harmed by that. And our buddies, the Security Exchange Commission, stepped in and uh, we're going to sue him for that. And I guess he saw it a little bit better to step away from his own company. Right. So uh, I want to point that out because you're seeing the importance of some of this financial reporting and how seriously, uh, you know, everybody takes that to a point where someone had to walk away, you know, with all the talent that he has, walk away from his own company. So uh, I want to point that out. You probably had seen that in some of the – I see it on – I saw it on Facebook. I get a CBS News feed for some reason on Facebook, so I think it's true, I mean, unless it's fake news. I don't know. Did anyone else hear that? <laughs> huh? He stepped down. Yeah. Oh, he's still CEO, but he stepped from chairman of the board. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. You know, for him, what he finds that in his couch, right, after a night of drinking. <laughs> so, um, so anyway. Okay. Good. Good. Thanks, guys for clarifying that. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, the financial reports that we have uh, with our chapter slides. Very simple. Revenue minus expenses gives us net income. And so revenue and expenses are obviously reported on the income statement, right? Okay, and I repeat that because a lot of times I'll get students that want to say something like cash is on the income statement. No, it's revenue minus expenses is equaling our net income on our income statement. Then what? We have our statement of retained earnings. Statement of retained earnings has the beginning balance. And in this example, it was zero because presumably this company had just started operations, right? So they wouldn't have had a previous retained earnings. They started at zero. You add the current year's net income, and then we would subtract any dividends that were paid. Dividends. We divide our earnings amongst our shareholders. We call that a dividend. So if you pay any earnings out, have you retained them? You're not retaining them if they're paying them out. So we would subtract that from the retained earnings in calculation then of the ending balance of retained earnings. When we get to the balance sheet, okay. Anytime you want to go ahead and work for me. Oh, wrong clicker. I tend to hoard clickers. And sometimes I grab the wrong one. I think this is the right one. Yeah. Okay. So then what? Then you come over and you come to the balance sheet, and we call it the balance sheet because what? Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. That balances thus the term balance sheet. So what's on the balance sheet? Assets, liabilities, and our stockholders' equity. Our assets, remember, have future economic benefit to the company. Cash is your favorite asset. Our liabilities are our bills. Our liabilities are our bills. Our liabilities, right? It's what we owe. It's the claim against our assets. And then we have our stockholders' equity. And uh, right now, stockholders' equity, we're saying, is our common stock and our retained earnings. And it'll be that for some time until we get into some of the later chapters. Uh, chapter 11, particularly, we'll learn that there's other parts of stockholders' equity. But right now, we're saying it's common stock and retained earnings. Don't worry about statement of cash flows right now. Income statement balance sheet are the two financial reports we're mostly interested in. Okay? So, just to review, 
we talked about assets being items that have future economic benefit. Your favorite asset is cash, right? Cash has future economic benefit. But if you have a what, $100 cash in one pocket, $40 cash, uh, $40 cell phone bill in the other pocket, then you really don't have the full rights to all of your cash, right? There's a claim against your cash, say this $40 cell phone bill, and so your actual claim to your cash is the residual, which is what? $60. Assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. This equation will always be in balance, and we will struggle with it. If it's not in balance, we'll keep working until we get it balanced uh, before we can issue our financial reports, right? Okay, and those are just the definitions there. Now, remember we had this messy little thing up here in which we did what? We had a lemon tree. And the lemon tree had, what, 20 lemons. We paid $20 for the tree, so we went ahead and divided and said, hey, the lemons must be worth a dollar each, right? $20 for a lemon tree, 20 lemons. Those are our assets. We decided to start a company that was going to be a lemon selling company. And so we incorporated and we issued ourselves $20 worth of stock in exchange for giving the corporation the lemons, right? So we've got $20 of common stock and the corporation would need to show on their financial reports, yes, we have $20 of assets and those are all owned by our owners and we have exchanged stock for that, right? So that stock sits there, $20. Then what? Remember, I think we were being kind of silly. We said we could spin the lemons and that's what made them valuable to our customers and so we were able to sell five lemons at three dollars each even though they only cost us a dollar each so our revenue whenever you make money in the line of business you have chosen to go into we call that revenue fifteen dollars of revenue minus the cost of the lemons dollar each five dollars dollar each uh, five lemons that's five dollars that's our cost of goods sold i said lemons in this case call it more generically cost of goods sold gives us gross profit of $10. And remember I said that gross profit is an important number to investors because they want to look and see that you have, what, something left over after you paid for the cost of whatever it is that you're selling. And they would like that number to be fairly healthy. So I'd say $10 is probably a goodie, pretty good on a revenue 15 to have a $10 gross profit. Then we said, uh-oh, our poor little tree is getting a little tired out there producing all those lemons so we went to the fertilizer store paid seven dollars cash took a bag of fertilizer to the tree back to our business and did what dumped it on the ground and i asked you if we dumped it on the ground is it expired yeah it's expired if it's dumped on the ground so we treat that as an expense expired as an expense and so we subtract the seven dollars from our gross profit yielding a net income of $3. Not bad for a year's work. We're $3 richer than we were when we started this whole thing. Yes, sir. That work capex, was it minimum $1 If it what? Uh, no, if it, if it was a capital expenditure, if it was for an asset, if we were purchasing equipment, then that's going to show on the balance sheet. That's not a expense item because it's not expensive future economic benefit is not expired. So if we spent $7, whatever, on equipment, it would not show there. It would go to the balance sheet. So why is the fertilizer just part of the cost of goods sold? Because it's not the cost of goods sold because the lemons are the things that is the good that we sold. The fertilizer is something that we spend in our day-to-day -day operations, like a light bill, a water bill, those sort of things. I mean, by that logic, you can make the argument that everything should be in cost of goods sold, and it's not. So it's the cost of the actual items that you sold. In this case, we happen to be growing lemons. Um, if it was shirts that we were buying, uh, that we were selling, and we had to buy them from a shirt manufacturer, whatever we paid that shirt manufacturer for those shirts would be the cost of goods sold and the water bill and the light bill and all that would be uh, a, an expense. So, I mean, there are accounting methods in which you could, uh, for example, figure out the cost of the fertilizer and the water and everything else in producing that inventory and count it as part of the cost of goods sold, but that would be a little 
kind of beyond where we're going with this. Um, that would be sort of, we'd start getting into, you know, agriculture accounting, okay? So kind of ignore the idea that it's lemons, okay? But uh, mo most of the time in here, what we'll talk about is you are a retail entity. So you're buying things that are already produced to sell to your customers. That cost is a cost of goods sold. Okay. But we take this fertilizer and we dump it on the ground. It's expired. We subtract that from the gross profit. That gives us net income of $3. And so not bad for a year's work. We're richer than we started this when we started this, aren't we? Which is what we wanted. Okay. So when we went to prepare the balance sheet then, we took a look and we have what? We still have 15 lemons left, don't we? Started with 20, sold five. We still have 15, a dollar each. That's $15 worth of lemons. Our cash, and I did a little bottom calculation over here to help us figure out the cash, which was our cash sales of $15. That's the $15 right there. If it was a cash sale, that's $15. I said we paid $7 cash for the fertilizer, so we're left with what? eight dollars so when we look at our assets we've got the lemons we've got the cash total assets add them together is 23 dollars right then we looked at our stockholders equity and our stockholders equity is still the stock twenty dollars remember that stock is just still sitting in the hands of our investors nothing has happened with it they're sitting there and they're hanging on to that stock right twenty dollars worth and then what then we had retained earnings and the retained earnings is three dollars now just to sort of write in somewhere in this already busy item if i can here we have what we have the beginning balance of retain earnings which was zero because we just started this business this year isn't it didn't we and then what then we have to add and we add what to that we add this year's NI is net income. What's the net income this year? $3. Okay. And then I subtract any dividends. And in this first year, you know what? I'm not going to pay any dividends. I'm writing that zero in there because I just started my business. I'm just getting off the ground. My investors might even be upset with me if I started parsing out dividends at this point, right? They're like, hey, we just invested. Let it ride. Don't start paying out dividends. And uh, let's see how we go into the second year. And so the ending balance is $3, isn't it? Is that the ending balance and retained earnings? $3? Okay, and so we have this $3 ending balance, and I uh, intentionally kind of write the beginning balance, the add, the subtract, the ending balance. That gives you a mnemonic there, base, because we're going to be looking at some uh, quiz questions that are very similar to your exam questions in which I'm going to give you the elements. I'm going to say the beginning balance of retained earnings was this, the revenue was that, the expense was that, revenue minus expenses and net income. They paid dividends of Y. What is the ending balance in retained earnings? Beginning, add, what do I add? Net income, subtract, what do I subtract? Dividends gives me the ending balance, right? And we'll see how we can practice with that in some of the questions that are coming up. But at the end, the balance sheet balances, doesn't it? Common stock plus the $3 that, my, that uh, I've become that much richer for the year gives me the $23, and that equals the asset, $23. Okay. Any question on that? Yes, sir. Well, I brought in value of $20, and so I'm not going to take, you know, back anything less than $20 worth of stock, right? Otherwise, I'd be kind of dumb. You know, I give $20 of lemons in there, and I take $15 worth of stock back. Why would I do that? So I'm taking stock that I perceive to have value of $20 in exchange for $20 worth of lemons, right? Is that my original stock before I sold the five lemons? Please clarify that question because it's not making sense to me. No. No. 
No, I had $20 worth of stock, and that stays $20 worth of stock regardless of what happens to the lemons. It's still $20 worth of stock. If you buy stock in a company and they sell lemons, do they come back to you and say, hey, uh, we sold some lemons, give us $5 of the stock back? Or do you continue to hold the stock? You guess? If you buy stock, do you think the company is going to come back to you after a year and say, you know, we sold some of our assets, so you got to give us some of the stock back? Do you think the capital markets work that way? Have you ever heard of such a thing? Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Once the stock is issued, the stock is in the hand of the investors. What happens to our assets? What happens to our liabilities? What happens to our revenue of expenses? Do not change the stock that's being held by the investors, right? That stays the same. Now, obviously, the investors could buy more stock from us if they wanted. Uh, we could, although beyond the scope of where we are right now, go into the open market and buy back our own stock. We call that treasury stock. But we're not talking about that right now. We're just assuming the investors are sitting there and just holding that stock, right, that $20 worth of stock. What's changing the dynamic part of stockholders' equity as a result of our day-to-day -day operations is that this retained earnings increase. That represents the activity for the year in which we went from what? From a zero retained earnings to a three by virtue of our net income, right? By virtue of our talent of generating revenue, by being able to sell those red lemons for more than we paid for them and not having to spend so much money to keep the lemon tree growing that at the end we were facing losses, right? So we ended up with three dollars of net income. Okay. Any other question? That's correct. Thank you. That equity is what we call book value. It's the cost. It's what we issued the stock for. Right now, this stock could be trading for $30 a share. I don't know. Okay. Now, uh, I think I sold this stock to you. And what's your name? Tiffany. Tiffany. I sold the stock to Tiffany. And in the example, I think I sold it to you for $23, yeah. right? And I said I was three. I could have sold it to you for $30. And I could have walked away as the original investor with $30 when I started with $20. I'm $10 richer now, right? And now Tiffany's saying, look, maybe looking at me going, what a fool. I guess he doesn't realize how valuable the spinning lemons are. And I'm going to turn this stock into $50 a share by showing more potential earnings. So the market's doing its thing. But on the, on the balance sheet, we're still having the stock at $20. Now, if the corporation went and issued more shares, and now we issued them for more than, let's say we issued 20 shares at a dollar each, let's say the shares are now trading for $2 each. We will bring that into our stockholders' equity, but we won't call it common stock. We'll call it additional paid in capital in excess of par, meaning that we're selling the stock for more than its par value. And so that's how increases in value of the stock would be reflected on the balance sheet if we sell it for more than its par value. Right now, I'm assuming I'm selling the stock at its par value. Okay. So right now, the main thing to keep in mind is that it's what I issued the stock for. It doesn't change as long as I don't issue new shares of stock. It's going to stay the same at the $20. It stays there at the book value. Okay. All right. Good. Any other question? Okay. Good. All right. So let's go ahead now. And in this highly sophisticated uh, example, we're going to go into year two. What you have on this slide right now is year what? Year two of our operations. This was year one. This is year two. Okay, and in year two, we're able to sell seven lemons. So we sell seven lemons in year two, and we sell them at, again, um, it's $3 per lemon, right? Yeah. We sell them again at $3 per lemon. We sell them for $21. So notice that our revenue for year two is what? 21. We report our revenue by year, don't we? We didn't add 15 plus 21 and say that it was, what does that come out to? 36 or something stupid like that. We don't come out and say, what is it, 46? 
I'm not good with numbers in my head, guys. My whole life, people always wanted me to do numbers in my head because I'm a CPA, and I'm like, well, that's why God invented calculators. But before we sat there and carried calculators around with this, I'd be out to dinner, have a couple of drinks with friends. I'd always get the bill to try to divide it up. I'd be sitting there half buzzed going, how am I supposed to do this? I can't do this. It's not God when they gave us phones that had calculators on them, right? Okay, so what is that, 46 or 36? 15 plus 21 would be 46, right? Okay. So what happened? No? 36? 36. 36. Okay. So what happens? My bottom line is, okay, that we don't what? We don't add this to the new year's revenue. We just say revenue for year two. Do we add these together? Revenue is 15. When you get into year two, you sell seven more lemons. Now the revenue is what? 21. When you uh, tell somebody you got a brand new job and they say, oh, okay, well, how much did you make? Are you going to tell them, oh, okay, let's see, I've been working there five years. I'm making 100,000 years, so 500,000. No, you're going to say what? 100,000. We report our revenue, our income by year, don't we? Okay, so revenue for year one was 15. We flip that back to zero and we start over again in year two, don't we? To calculate our revenue. And so if we sell seven lemons in year two, three dollars each, that's 21. Remember the lemons cost us a dollar each, didn't they? Lemon tree cost us $20. It had 20 lemons. The lemons cost us a dollar each. So if we sold seven, our cost of goods sold, COGS is a common way that we'll abbreviate in this class, cost of goods sold, is $7. Our gross profit is 14 Now, we go and we look at the lemon tree again, and we say, well, last year we dumped the bag of fertilizer on it, and the trees lived, so let's go ahead and let's dump a bag of fertilizer in the tree in year two. So we go, yes, sir. It's the cost of whatever we sold. Okay. Not on the not on the income statement as a cost. That's correct because we haven't sold them yet. In other words, cost of goods sold is a fancy way for showing the value that has expired on the income statement for our inventory items. When we call it cost of goods sold, because our investors want to know, hey, what's the margin? What's left after? What's left over after you've paid for what you? Uh, uh, what you're selling, okay? So our cost of goods sold is the the part of the lemons that we've actually sold. Seven dollars, the amount of lemons that we've actually sold. Seven dollars, one dollar each, seven lemons. Yes, sir. Um, let's say you have something that's seven lemons, and three lemons, they paid us for it, or they didn't pay for it. If the lemons died, uh, we would consider that and it matters if it's normal spoilage or abnormal spoilage because we can have this happen all the time, you know, where we pick the lemons, they turn, they, they die, whatever, and we get no value out of them. Uh, and if that happens all the time, that's normal spoilage. We just consider it a cost of goods sold. We include it in the cost of goods sold. Yes, cost of goods sold would be 10 in that case because we're including the dying lemons. We're including the lemons that died as sold. Okay? I'll give you another example. I, I will talk more about this, but I call it cost of goods sold and stoled because you could, and you could probably also say spoiled, cost of goods sold, stoled, and spoiled. And that what happens if we go out there one day and say, hey, what the heck? What happened? Where? Papa, there were lemons here, and now they're not here anymore. What happened to them? Oh, I guess the raccoon stole them. I don't know. Whatever happens to them. Let me explain a little bit. My, when my, my dad, my nephew's now 38, but when he was little, 
they, my dad took them out in the backyard and they planted corn and all this corn grew. And then my dad went and picked the corn and didn't wait for my nephew. I don't know what he was thinking. So my nephew's three years old, started runs in, Papa, somebody stole the corn. Okay, so somebody stole the lemons, they're gone. We would include them in the cost of goods sold, right? Those ones that also got stolen. Assuming that that's not abnormal. If we have an abnormal spoilage, something that doesn't happen all the time, then FASB requires us to call that out on our financial reports as an unusual event, and we would have to give a line item for lemons sold or spoilage, abnormal spoilage, and we would probably footnote what precipitated that and what caused that so that investors are understanding. Because otherwise, investors might look and say, what the hell? What happened to the gross margin? Because we're going to still have $21 of sale, aren't we? And, um, you know, our gross margin percentage right now is, th what, about 33%? If I'm doing the math right in my head, and you know that I don't do math right in my head. But if you take 14, no, really? Are you really going to do this to me? My pen decides to go on strike with me. <laughs> the actual pens and the one that's supposed to write. don't like to write sometimes. But if you sit there and you take the gross profit of 14 and you divide that by the sales of 21, if I'm not mistaken, that's what? Is that about 33%, guys? What is it? 67%? See, I'm telling you. I'm not kidding. I don't do numbers in my head. 67%? Okay. Um, now, what happens? You have that 67%. Um, if what you just stated happened, a bunch of lemons died or whatever and didn't get picked up, whatever, then that would go from, you know, $11 of gross profit, right? Because my cost would be 10, cost of goods sold would be 10 minus the 21 revenue. That would give me 11 co uh, gross profit divided by the uh, $21 of revenue. Who wants to give me that number since you guys are so slick? Huh? What is it? 55%. So all of a sudden now what? My gross margin, my gross profit percentage is going down, isn't it? And so investors might, and if you really had a really huge number here that was feeding into that cost of goods sold, and all of a sudden my gross profit percentage was coming down to say 30%, 20%, investors are going to be, what happened? So what? FASB requires is if you have an abnormal spoilage, then you should call that out as a separate line item on your financial report so they can see what happened and there'd be a footnote, et cetera. Okay, so now my big job is to see if I can get this pen working again. There's like no rhyme or reason as to why it uh, decides to stop working sometimes. And I always end up having to go through some sort of ritual here to take the battery out and put it back in. That doesn't work. So then I get to...